Okay, in this lecture, we're going to cover intermolecular forces, namely dispersion forces and dipole dipole forces. So there's various types of intermolecular forces. We introduced this concept in the previous lecture, so be sure to go back and watch that one if you haven't. In this one, we're going to expand and describe exactly what dispersion and dipole 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 forces are. In the future lecture, we're going to cover hydrogen bonding and ion dipole. So today we're concentrating on these van der Waals forces or van der Waals forces, two types of intermolecular forces. The first one is the dispersion force. And this might be the hardest one to actually visualize because it deals with the concept of polarizability. And so what I'm showing here is two different uh, nuclei and atoms, I should say. So the black dots here are our nuclei. Uh, the red part is maybe the electron cloud that is around this nucleus. And, you know, maybe this is a helium atom and two helium atoms. Okay. Here they're far enough apart, right, that they're not really interacting. But if I bring these two things closer together and move helium A to the right and helium B to the left as they approach, well, now we have this picture too. And remember, in each helium atom, there's two electrons. So maybe there's a helium atom on the left here with an electron on the left side and the right side of this atom, right? And maybe this helium atom has an electron here and here. For now, we're thinking about this sort of particle Bohr model of the atom. But what happens as I move these two things together if both electrons are over here on the left side of helium B? Well, now all the negative charge in this helium atom is over here on the left, okay? And so high density of negative I'm, I'm showing as red here, low density of negative I'm showing as blue. So when all the electrons are on the left side of helium B, well, now there's a very, very strong negative charge on the left side of this atom. And by contrast, there's a lack of electrons over here. So that's kind of positive, right? Because there's still protons in the nucleus. So on the left side of atom B here for helium, we'll call this helium B. It looks like this for helium A there is no really net negative and positive side because the electrons are sort of on each side. It's balanced out. But at this snapshot in time, when both electrons for helium are on the left side, there's this negative charge all overall on the left. Now, polarizability is the tendency of this electron cloud to distort, and it distorts in response to this charge. So while helium B at this instant, this moment in time, has this negative charge on the left, well now these electrons in helium A, opposites repel, or sorry, like charges repel, opposites attract, like charges repel, so the electron, specifically this guy here, sees this negative charge and wants to get away from it. So the electron moves over to the left side of helium A. And now helium A looks like this with both its electrons on the left, and helium B has both of its electrons on the left. And now each helium atom has this half negative, half positive charge. So the left side of the helium atoms are negative, the right side of the helium atoms are positive. And now these two helium atoms are attracted because of these partial charges. So this is the nature of polarizability, right? How polarizable something is describes you know, how easy this effect happens. And the easier it is to distort this electron cloud, to move this electron over to one side of the molecule or the other, right, the easier that is, well, the more often these types of forces will become apparent. And so the more you can do this, the stronger that force becomes, okay? So this is a dispersion force that results right here. So the dispersion force is the attraction, the force of attraction here, between these two different atoms that sets up because the helium is polarizable. And the helium on the left here, helium A, gets polarized.
moving its electron to the left in response to the left side, the negative charge of this helium atom. Okay, so that pushing of the electron is the polarization process. Okay, so this dispersion force is the force that results from that polarization process. And, you know, what I'm drawing here is, of course, a bit of a lie. I'm looking at these electrons as sort of particles, right? But really, quantum mechanics tells us, you know, these electrons aren't particles, they're these particle wave kind of things. And it's really more appropriate to not think of, you know, electrons as these certain charged spheres, but that this overall electron cloud is sort of this squishy negative cloud. And the same thing applies here. If this squishy negative cloud, you know, deforms a little bit to the left, well, now this squishy negative cloud might deform to the left as well, right? Because this is all negative charge that pushes on this negative charge. So it's still a, a deformation that sets up this dispersion force. There's still gonna be a plus on this side and a negative on this side relative to its original drawing. Okay, so that's still a dispersion force. Now, a little bit of history here because I like to weave in these tails. The dispersion force was first conjectured by Fritz London. And what's kind of comical here is that uh, Fritz London was German. Okay, so Fritz uh, had German heritage. He was a German. But his last name was London, and he published his really important paper in Paris. So really an international collaboration by this single guy, this German whose name was London, who did the work in Paris. So he says, following Van der Waals, we have learned to think of the molecules as centers of forces and to consider these so-called molecular forces as the common cause for various phenomena, the deviations of the gas equation from that of an ideal gas, as one knows indicates the identity of the molecular forces in the liquid with those in the gaseous state. Basically what he's getting at is by this time in the 1930s, people were measuring things like gas pressures and realizing that this ideal gas law and, you know, Boyle's law and all these things we used for decades and decades didn't quite work as accurately as we thought they should. And it's because of these intermolecular forces that are taking place. And for something like helium that shouldn't have any complicated forces, it's a noble gas, you still see deviations. And the reason is because even for helium, you have dispersion forces. So these are the forces that get set up between helium atoms that make them attracted to one another. This dispersion force can hold heliums to other heliums. And it's because of this force that you can have liquid helium at all. It's not always a gas because at certain temperatures when you get low enough, the heliums um, don't have enough energy to overcome this dispersion force, so they stay close together. Another thing about uh, Fritz London uh, was this was taking place in the 30s, um, and he was German, but uh, he was Jewish, and actually had to leave Germany in 1933, went to Paris, then uh, tried to uh, get further away from uh, Germany, who obviously the political uh, landscape was changing at that time, um, and, and as uh, a Jewish person, he wanted to get further and further away from Germany, so he uh, emigrated to uh, Paris and then to the United States and actually spent um, the rest of his life working at Duke University in the United States. And that's sort of a microcosm for um, how a lot of scientists uh, moved from Germany, which was a scientific powerhouse, uh, to the United Kingdom, to France, and to the United States at that time period. Uh, but enough with the history. So that's London dispersion forces, one of the intermolecular forces we're con concerned about. Now, you can have dispersion forces in helium, you can have dispersion forces in propane, you can have dispersion forces in uh, octane, you can have dispersion forces in every molecule. So every molecule will have a dispersion force. And the size of that dispersion force depends on a few factors. The size of that atom or molecule the number of electrons in that atom or molecule, and the shape of that molecule. Okay, so think about this squishy electron cloud and the force that results, right? So this is the dispersion force that results, but what if this isn't helium, okay? What if this is neon? 
If this is neon, then there's not just two electrons, there's 10. And so this is gonna get quite crowded here. I think that's 10. This negative charge is five times bigger than it was in helium. And so the force that results is much stronger in neon than it is in helium. Because now you have 10 electrons that are part of that negative force instead of just two. Okay, so it's easy to visualize why the number of electrons will matter. More electrons, more dispersion force. The size of the atom or molecule also matters because the larger the atom, the further away those electrons are from the nucleus. So remember, even though these electrons are on one side or the other, the protons are still right here in the nucleus. And so the larger the atom, the more polarizable it will be because those electrons are further from the nucleus. Remember, polarizability has everything to do with the squishiness of this electron cloud, right? How much does it get shifted around? How sloshy is it, right? And so the bigger the atom, the further you can get these electrons away from the nucleus, those positive charges, and so the less effect those positive charges have on the electrons, and the freer the electrons are to move around. So the polarizability uh, does go up with number of electrons, as we saw, but also by the size of the atom, right? Because the larger the atom, the further away you are from the nucleus, and the freer those electrons are to move around. Now, the third thing that is not so obvious about factors that affect dispersion forces is the shape of the molecule. So, two different molecules with the same mass, as shown here, this is pentane, right? So this is a linear pentane. Uh, this is uh, n-pentane on the top. And this is, I don't know, C-pentane. They're the same exact molecular formulas, right? C5H12. The same weight. They'll have the same number of electrons. They'll be the same sized molecule, right? But the shape matters here. Okay, same molecular weight, same number of electrons. But the shape matters. And the shape matters because it's about the surface of interaction. So imagine the electron cloud and pentane. Here it is. And maybe I'll draw this one in a different color just because that's slightly more fun to do. These are the electron clouds, right? About around pentane one and pentane two. Now, this is a whole lot more interaction between these two molecules, right? Then, the cyclic pentane down here. All right, so here it's just a shape argument that the strength of this interaction is about the area over which that interaction can manifest itself. And the interaction of that area, or the area of that interaction, is larger in pentane uh, when it's in this linear form than when it's in this sort of more spherical compact form. Okay, so the shape of molecules will also have an effect. Okay, so what we're learning here is that the dispersion force is in everything, okay? In helium, it's the only force, so it matters. But in other things, it may or may not be important depending on what other forces there are. Okay, it may be much more important if the molecule is very, very large than if it's very, very small. It might be more important for very, very large atoms versus very, very small atoms. And so that's what we're learning on, on this slide is that the number of electrons, the size of the atom, and the shape of the molecule or atom affects the amount of dispersion force. And the stronger dispersion force, the higher the temperature you need to get to before a phase change, right? So although we're learning the basics here of these interactions and intermolecular forces, it's always tied to some physical property. So let's see this manifested polarizability and the boiling point. Right, so polarizability again being related to this 
dispersion force. If something is less polarizable, it has a lower boiling point. So let's make sure we understand exactly what is written in that sentence. If something is less polarizable, meaning the electron cloud around that molecule or atom is, you know, less squishy, it's harder to displace, that means it's going to have a weaker dispersion force. That means the temperature does not have to be as high, the temperature is lower, to get it to boil. If something has a very high polarizability, then the dispersion force will increase stronger forces, mean you'll need more temperature to overcome them and it'll be a higher boiling point. So that's really the goal of this part of the lecture is to be able to understand conceptually why that's the case. If it's more polarizable, the electron clouds move around more, that's the case for larger things, for things with more electrons, for things that are flat versus spherical, you set up more dispersion forces, those forces become harder to overcome, hence you need a higher boiling point. So that's what's played out here, right? Things like uh, iodine will have a much higher boiling point than xenon. You know, yes, they're both, um, you know, on the right side of the periodic table, one's an atom, one's a molecule, but, you know, it's because of the types of dispersion forces that result in this pretty high boiling point uh, for iodine, considering we, you know, think of it near the noble gas, uh, that it's a halogens, most of which are, are liquids and gases. Uh, so 458 Kelvin is a pretty high uh, boiling point compared to its other neighbors. So uh, we're going to pause here and think about if we can justify, take 30 or seconds, 30 seconds or so to think about, if you can justify why and each reason why F2 has a greater boiling point than neon. Good luck. Okay, time's up. Okay, why does fluorine have a greater boiling point than neon? Okay, well, there's actually a couple reasons. It'll have a greater boiling point because it has more, uh, I should say, stronger intermolecular forces. So that's, that's the basic, you know, first level answer. Stronger intermolecular forces. Anything with a greater boiling point has stronger intermolecular forces. But let's break that down. Why does fluorine have stronger intermolecular forces than neon? Okay, a lot of reasons, each of which we covered. It's only dispersion forces, but the dispersion forces increase in fluorine because, well, there's more electrons in fluorine, right? The fluorine molecule has 18 compared to 10 in a neon atom. Reason two is that it's a higher molecular weight. Okay, a higher molecular weight probably means on average the electrons are further from nucleus. It also helps that it's a molecule versus an atom. And the third reason, which I'm guessing not a lot of people would have gotten, but the third reason here is the shape, okay? Think of fluorine like this, which is this flatter shape, then neon, which is just spherical. So the same sort of argument we made here for the pentanes would apply for F2 versus neon. So the reason that the boiling points are so different for fluorine and neon is because fluorine has more electrons, it has a higher molecular weight, and it's less compact. Okay. The next interaction we're going to talk about is dipole-dipole force. All right, so we're covering different intermolecular forces. Dispersion force, every single 
entity has a dispersion force. If it has electrons and protons, it has dispersion forces because it's polarizable to some degree. Now, certain compounds will have dipole-dipole forces, and these will be much stronger than dispersion forces. And so polar molecules is what we're talking about here. And just as a refresher, remember a polar molecule, okay, is when you have two things bound together, so we can even think about uh, water, most important substance, so one I use a lot. Uh, oxygen is a lot more electronegative, so these electrons in this chemical bond right here actually spend a lot more time near oxygen because it likes to hog those electrons. And so overall, oxygen gets a partial negative charge here. And so we draw that with a delta symbol. Sometimes you'll see that as blue, uh, sorry, as red down here. Delta negative. The hydrogen in this example because its electrons in this bond are spent closer to oxygen further from hydrogen, hydrogen here is kind of like it's just bare proton that's left, and so it gets this partial positive charge. So in this situation where you have atoms in a chemical bond that aren't sharing equally, you get this one atom, oxygen here, that is more negative and one atom that is more positive. We call this a dipole, okay? And we call this molecule overall polar. So if the molecule is polar overall, then one end of the molecule will be negative, one end will be positive. And that's what I'm showing down here with acetonitrile, okay? The CH3 end has the positive charge and the CN end has the negative charge because nitrogen is a lot more electronegative. Now, what happens is this positive end can be attracted to the negative end of another molecule. And so this is the intermolecular force we're talking about here that results. It's between this positive end and this negative end that we're talking about. So this is the dipole-dipole force. And you can see, you know, it's a similar picture to what we talked about with dispersion forces back here. This was still a positive and negative that were attracted due to, you know, an unequal balancing of where the electrons were. Only here, in dispersion, this is fleeting. This is only, you know, occasional. Uh, you have to bring something near it for this polarizability to, you know, be established. Dipole is stronger because this is a permanent unequal sharing of electrons across the molecule. It is not fleeting, it is not just a snapshot, nothing else required. The electrons are permanently at different locations. There is a permanent charge difference on different ends of the molecule. And so this is a stronger force than dispersion, okay? And so that's what we get here is all these dipole-dipole forces that get set up, okay? But of course you can also have repulsions like here if the two negative sides were oriented towards one another but usually the molecules will of course get pushed away and reorient themselves right such that the positive and negative gets attracted to one another so that's a dipole dipole interaction as opposed to just a dispersion interaction now dipole dipole interactions right can tell us something about the boiling point because the stronger the dipole interaction, the higher the boiling point, the more that has to be overcome to get the liquid to boil. Same with melting, the higher the melting point. Again, it's always these physical properties that are attached to the intermolecular forces. And so let's think about molecules of approximately equal mass, you know, size and shape. So all three of these molecules here, right? have about the same number of electrons, they have about the same uh, size, similar shapes, so the dispersion forces here are all similar. Just because, this is important, just because uh, I call this acetonitrile as having a dipole-dipole force doesn't mean it doesn't have dispersion. It also has dispersion. Everything has a dispersion force. It's just acetonitrile has dispersion forces and dipole-dipole. This propane doesn't really have a dipole-dipole force. Why? Because 
the sharing of the electrons is pretty similar between the carbons and the hydrogens. There's not really a dipole that develops. And it's really symbolized here uh, by 0.1 debye. This is a unit of, of that uh, dipole. So this really only has dispersion, not really dipole-dipole forces. Dipole-dipole forces are stronger. So as I go to higher dipole strength, the boiling point goes up. Right from 231 below room temperature in propane to 294 about room temperature in acetaldehyde to 355 much higher than room temperature in acetonitrile. So, again, the trend in boiling point for any of these properties is those will change in boiling point, it goes up as the intermolecular force gets stronger. Now since these things with dipole-dipole interactions also have dispersion forces, which has a greater effect? Pound-for-pound dipole-dipole interactions are stronger. So if the molecules are of comparable size and shape, then the dipole interactions are likely the dominating force. That's exactly what I'm showing here, right? There's a big change in these boiling points because there's a big change in the dipoles. However, you can have instances where one molecule is much larger than another, such that the dispersion forces might become more important. So there's dodecane, which is a molecule that looks like two propanes put together. So I'm going to take the shortcut and draw it like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right? So there's a carbon at each of these sort of kinks. If we think about drawing in organic chemistry. So there's my 10, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 uh, carbon atoms, right? And there's hydrogens attached accordingly to all of these. Now, this has a boiling point. Uh, it basically has no dipole, but its boiling point is 489 Kelvin. This is higher than this, even though this decane uh, actually, it's dodecane, I think, that is 489. So we need two more of these. That's 12 carbons. Uh, even though there's no dispersion forces here in dodecane, its boiling point is higher. Well, the boiling point's only higher if the intermolecular forces are higher. And the intermolecular forces are higher because this huge molecule has such a strong dispersion force that it overcomes the pound for pound stronger dipole force in acetonitrile. So that's sort of the rule of thumb here. If they're comparable sizes and shapes and, you know, molecular weights, then dipole forces are always stronger than dispersion. But if it's a much, much larger molecule, the dispersion forces might take over and result in a higher boiling point. The point always remains, though, that as the intermolecular forces get stronger, the boiling point goes up. So if one molecule is much larger than another, dispersion forces will likely determine its physical properties. Okay, so we've covered dispersion forces, we've covered dipole-dipole forces. In the next video, we'll get to hydrogen bonding and ion-dipole forces, which are really much stronger forces. And hydrogen bonding, of course, is probably the most important since it affects the properties of water, the basis of human life. So that'll do it for this video. See you next time.